Anna LaPay joins us now in studio to discuss the latest release of her mother's book, her frustration over what's not being discussed at the UN Climate Change Conference this week, and her reasons for hope when so much environmental news is so dire. So Anna, thank you for joining us here in studio. Well, it's really fun to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, I have the book here, Diet for a Small Planet. It has revolutionary the first time around. What is different between this edition and the original? Well, in a lot of ways, a lot of it's the same. So this is the 50th anniversary edition of the book, and so much of what my mother was saying 50 years ago is still true today, which is that what we eat, what we put in our bodies is of course central to our own health, but it's also really a key part of our planetary health. And now we see how much of an impact our food systems is having on climate change. Uh, but what is new in this book is a new introductory chapter from my mother that sort of ties five decades of her thinking together mm. and helps tell the stories of many of the social movements around the world that are working to make food that's better for our bodies and better for the planet. And then the recipe section, which is about half the book, has been totally revamped for the 21st century and has uh, a, a several, a bunch of new recipes actually. And then all of the, the recipes in there have been tweaked in some way. Okay, well, I hope we can dig into that at the end of the conversation a little bit. But first, I, I do wanna check in about your mom and see how she's doing because she is she's still a powerhouse yeah so i was just actually talking with her this morning and we realized she has done she and then some of uh, we have done 50 events for this 50th anniversary already since it came out just a month ago and i was teasing her that she's sort of the poster child of this plant center diet mm -hmm. that we celebrate in the book because she has so much energy and so much joy that she brings to the work mm -hmm. and she's still going strong at 78. and she's about to get her 20th honorary degree yes yeah, so 20th book 20th honorary degree. Wow. All right. I want to read a quote from the new edition here. And it says, even if the world immediately cut all fossil fuel emissions for energy, food systems emissions alone would make it impossible to meet the targets for limiting global warming set in the 2015 Paris Agreement. And your point here is that the food system is responsible for 37% of our emissions, so it's not enough to just focus on fossil fuels. Can you unpack this a little more for exactly. us? Exactly, I'm really glad you, you read that quote because that is so key, and of course we're talking while COP26 is happening, mm -hmm. and it's really important that every single sector play its part. I certainly wouldn't want anybody listening for to hear me and think that I mean, let's not worry about the oil and gas or transportation or mm -hmm. buildings. I'm saying that if we are going to solve this crisis, every single sector, has to step up mm -hmm. and food and agriculture in particular because as you say it's more than a third of all emissions we also know that it is uh, agriculture especially agribusiness demands for animal feed for factory farms that's driving so much deforestation so we know we need to keep forest standing well the fact that 80 percent of the deforestation in the Amazon has been driven by uh, demands for land for feed crops mm -hmm. or cattle grazing is one of the things that we need to be talking Talking about so that's one of the messages that we hope people hear from us so when we look at the past 50 years some things have changed right I mean I think we generally are more accepting of this concept of the importance of whole foods and of eating more plant-centered diets and we see the problems with aggressive farming but there's still unfortunately this incredible environmental degradation because of our food system and in many ways we're in a worse place than we were 50 years ago so what is it do you think that's keeping us as a society from adopting the principles that are in this book mm -hmm. well you really put your finger on it that we're living in this both and time that we both know so much more about what a healthy diet looks like and it looks like centering plants on our plate and it looks like trying to do what we can to get chemicals out of farming uh, to adopt practices that are better for soils, for instance, all those things we know we need to do. And there's there's a lot of popular acceptance for that way of eating. So why don't we see more change? And I think so much of it has to do with uh, this connection between food and democracy and that the kinds of policies that we see being passed don't actually reflect our shared values that I think many of us hold about wanting to have healthy food available to everybody and have clean air and clean water, that so much of our political system is beholden to corporate interests that are really powerful. And uh, the fact that there are now more agribusiness lobbyists on Capitol Hill than there are lobbyists for the oil and gas industry, to me is just one signal of just how much influence uh, corporate power has in terms of the policies that we need to pass, the kinds of regulations we would need to pass to really shift systems.
Right, so that's a follow the money, right? Where are we putting our money and what does that show about our values? Exactly. So let's turn to COP26 because it's going on right now and ostensibly this is, you know, provinces, countries, states coming together to say, what can we agree on to make the world a more environmentally sound place? And one of there's a California delegation that's there. It is several of the California leaders uh, in the administration on the environment front, uh, 15 California legislators, all Democrats. Um, but we talked with Jared Blumenfeld. He's the California, you know him because mm -hmm. you just had a, a, an interview with him right before the pandemic, but he's California Secretary of Environmental Protection. And I want to share an audio message that he sent us talking about what he hopes to accomplish by being at the conference. What's my top agenda item for the conference? So I guess mine is that hopefully we won't need a COP27. I mean, there's been 26 of these things, and it's about time we figured this out. Um, ultimately, you've got all these folks. They stand up on the podium. They make big, bold promises. We need to turn those promises into action. And the action happens at the local and state level. So what actions has California taken and what do we still need to do? Yeah, well, it's great to hear Jared's voice and it's great to hear that message because he is absolutely right. There is so much power that states have, particularly a state like California, right? Huge agricultural producer and huge economy. And it's been really encouraging to see that the state has actually passed some really good policies and put money behind some of the kinds of policies we need to help farmers make this transition away from a really fossil fuel dependent way of farming mm -hmm. to one that's better for the environment, better for communities. And so, for instance, uh, we're seeing for the first time $100 million dedicated to farm worker housing that will help those workers be protected better for climate shocks. We're seeing tens of millions of dollars to help farmers transition to organic farming in the state. We're seeing millions going to healthy soils programs. It's really encouraging. I think the message I would give our state is that those kinds of investments need to happen every year in an ongoing way and they need to grow if we're going to really reach our climate ambitions as a state. And they can't just be the kinds of things we fund when we have the boom economy mm -hmm. that we are lucky to have right now. We know the California economy is very volatile. So we need to be ready to really step up as a state and invest in uh, these long term and do things like pass the kind of bond measures that we're going to need to have consistent funding for these kinds of policies. You have some frustrations about what conversation is taking place at COP26 when it comes to food and that perhaps there isn't enough of it. Yes, and this is actually a, a huge frustration, not just of mine, but for all of the, the advocates around the world that have been really trying to center conversations about food and agriculture in climate policy. As we've been saying already, it's 37% of emissions. It's central to the story. Uh, there's a big concern that if we don't cap the uh, trend lines around meat and dairy production worldwide, that those will just go off the charts and really lock us into uh, a real climate catastrophe. And yet there isn't a single day dedicated to food and agriculture at COP26. And the mm. kinds of policies we're hearing, I just uh, was reading the press release from our Secretary Vilsack of the Department of Agriculture about the policy he just announced which is $5 billion partnership with the United Arab Emirates. And that policy, unfortunately, is pushing us toward keeping uh, a reliance on pesticides and artificial fertilizers and pushing for this idea that um, some folks may be hearing about called net zero, which isn't actually real zero. It's really not moving the needle. So a lot of us are concerned that to the extent food is being talked about, it's being talked about with um, some words that might be more like greenwashing than actually mm. the kind of tough policies that we need. There is a lot of uh, you know, existential dread when it comes to climate change and it comes to the environment overall. And yet there's a word that pops up over and over again in your mother's writing and in the books you've authored, and that's hope. You wrote a book called Hope's Edge. Can you tell us about that strength of hope, the need for hope at this time, and how you yourself find that hope and keep moving forward? Yeah, um, I'm glad you asked it because, uh, you know, I think, um, probably like many of us, I've experienced levels of climate despair that I've really never experienced before. I, I lived through, like many of the, your, your viewers uh, from the San Francisco Bay Area, you know, lived through that, that day last year when the sun never came out. Yeah. Uh, you know, had to explain to my kids why they couldn't play outside because the, you know, the, the wildfire smoke that was climate induced was everywhere. And so I found myself having to kind of remind myself what I mean by hope a lot these days. And what my mother and I have come to realize about hope is that it's really 
a source of energy that comes from taking action and, and being part of trying to make the change that you want to see in the world, that it, it comes from our sense of possibility that is grounded in the evidence we've seen as researchers. We, my mother and I have traveled around the world and we have met such incredible social movement leaders, incredible city government leaders, incredible people in the media who have made change possible up against the biggest odds you could possibly imagine. And those people have taught us to be what we call ourselves now, uh, possibilists. Hmm. So we're not optimists, mm -hmm. we're not pessimists. Either one of those kind of presumes a kind of hubris about the future you think is going to happen. Mm -hmm. We are possibilists. And it's from that sense of possibility that I get my hope. And it's from being part, even if it's a small part, but feeling like I'm part of trying to create the world that I wanna see for my children. Anna, thank you for joining us in studio and thank you for bringing this message of hope. Thanks for having me.